أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأيوب إذ نادى ربه أني مسني الضر وأنت أرحم الراحمين فاستجبنا له فكشفنا ما به من ضر وآتيناه أهله ومثلهم معهم رحمة من عندنا رحمة من عندنا وذكرى للعابدين وإسماعيل وإدريس وذا الكفل كل من الصابرين وأدخلناهم في رحمتنا إنهم من الصالحين وذنون إذ ذهب مغاضبا فظن أن لن نقدر عليه فنادى في الظلمات أن لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين فاستجبنا له ونجيناه من الغم وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين وزكريا إذ نادى ربه رب لا تذرني فردا وأنت خير الوارثين فاستجبنا له ووهبنا له يحيى وأصلحنا له زوجه إنهم كانوا يسارعون في الخيرات، إنهم كانوا يسارعون في الخيرات ويدعوننا رغبا ورهبا وكانوا لنا خاشعين. Assalamu alaikum, greetings, hello, good morning and good evening, whatever is applicable at time zones. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the Pakistan Orthopedic Association. Pleasure of welcoming uh, you to this uh, session in which we have uh, our faculty from Pakistan, Dr. Izwan Haroon, and our faculty from uh, Thailand, Dr. Tamnani Rumprai. We hope that this is going to be for today is lateral ankle instability. Now, that is a common, commonly seen condition in orthopedic practice uh, with uh, where patients with uh, sports injuries come and uh, uh, the management uh, very conservative to operative. Uh, a lot of uh, new changes in the approach and management have taken place. So we of uh, ha having experts in this field talk to uh, us and convey to us what is the latest uh, trend in the management. So with that, I would first like to invite uh, Dr. Rizwan Haroon, who is a consultant at Aga Khan University Hospital in Karachi, Pakistan. He has a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery from China. Uh, so I would like him to start with his talk on the basic uh, anatomy of the lateral collateral ligament and the pathophysiology of the injury of the lateral instability and the conservative management. So over to you, Dr. Izwan. Thank you, Dr. Tashreen. So assalamu alaikum. Hello, Swati Kha for my Thai people. Uh, we have got fellows of Dr. Chamnani joining us. So I will be talking a bit about uh, the anatomy and the pathophysiology and the conservative part of the webinar. So um, uh, this is my disclosure slide. I have nothing to disclose. 
So lateral inversion ankle injury is the most common injury in sports, accounting to about 16 to 21 percent of all the athletic injuries. Chronic instability of the ankle is likely only if both the anterior talofibular ligament and the calcaneofibular ligaments have been completely torn. So symptomatic uh, ankle instability occurs in about 10 to 20 percent of the patient, in spite of all your best efforts. So as we know, the lateral collateral ligament complex consists of uh, three uh, parts: the anterior talofibular ligament, the calcaneofibular ligament, and the posterior talofibular ligament. So the anterior talofibular ligament is the weakest of all. The CFL is about two times stronger than the ATFL, and PTFL is about twice as strong as the ATFL. So we know from anatomy that ATFL, the anterior talofibular ligament, is taut when the ankle is in plantar flexion, and CFL and PTFL are taut when the ankle is in dorsiflexion position. So this is very important whenever you are doing an anterior draw test for checking the integrity of the ATFL. So it should be in plantar flexion. Regarding the pathophysiology, there are two factors which can lead to chronic ankle instability. The anatomical factor consists of pathological laxity of the ankle ligaments and the problematic bony structure, such as the hind foot varus. The functional factors include the neuromuscular and proprioception impairments. So, chronic ankle instability can be divided into two types: the mechanical types, which is basically because of the surgical and stable ankle, like. Uh, there is some more posterior fibula or the injury to the anterior or talofibular ligament, and it is very easy to diagnose. The difficult one is the functional, where the the ankle is unstable perceptionally. So it has been said that uh, the when there is perceptional loss, so joint orientation is usually lost. So this is one of the factor which should be kept in mind whenever we are treating any patient with ankle instability. So the diagnosis, the diagnosis is usually clinical, and there is no accepted standard of how much laxity is too unstable. The key is to determine whether the instability is the cause of the patient's symptoms or not. So regarding some thing about the symptoms, the patient usually gave us an uh, history of uh, giving out of the ankle, just like the knee joint. Uh, the patient says that my knee joint will give place so as for the ankle whenever there is an atfl or in an instable ankle the patient gives complaint of giving out of the ankle and about 2 to 3 lateral ankle sprains in the last one year patient may also complain of pain and swelling over the medial or the lateral side of the ankle after prolonged walking and standing so whenever we are examining a patient you have to look for the tender points as you know that as per the origin of the atfl Whenever ATFL is injured, the anterior tenderness will be anterior to the fibula tip. Wherever, wherever there is tenderness over the anterior medial side of the ankle, it is usually due to the OCD tendinitis or the deltoid ligament sprain. Tenderness over the posterior lateral ankle indicates some peroneal pathology. It could be a tear. It could be a peroneal tendinitis. So the physical examination is very start with inspection. And palpation, and you have to look for the structural cause, like hind foot varus. The hind foot motion should be recorded, and the peroneal muscle strength should be tested. This is very important. Signs of generalized ligamentous laxity should also be elicited, and stability test. Although they are not very, uh, very sure, uh, specificity is less, but you have to do the anterior draw and the tailor tilt test. And the proprioception is usually abnormal in patients with chronic ankle instability, and the modified Romberg test is used to examine proprioception. So this is how you do a plantar flexion, and you uh, put an anterior driving force, and if the ankle, and you have to compare it with the sound side, and this is used to check the anterior talofibular ligament. So if the movement is more than three mm from the normal side, it is considered to be positive. And this is the Taylor tilt test. So you, uh, this is for the calcaneofibular ligament, and this is usually considered to be positive whenever there is more than uh, five degree of the uh, tilt as compared to the normal side, or ten degree overall tilt. If the Taylor tilt is more than ten degree, it should be considered positive, irrespective of the other side. 
CT and MRI usually are uh, done to rule out the concomitant causes like osteochondral defect of the talus, tarsal coalition, or the peroneal tendon tears. Same goes for the magnetic MRI. They are very good for eliciting the OCDs and the ligamentous tear. But in our part of the world, they are usually the cost. Uh, they are the cost is the limiting factor. So just a brief overview about the non-operative management. So non-operative is functional rehabilitation has a high probability of success in functional ankle instability. However, the likelihood of success is decreased with mechanical instability. If a patient has got functional instability and the mechanical instability is not there, the results are very good. Six weeks of aggressive physical therapy is recommended and orthotics can be useful during the rehab program, which includes the lateral heel width or a heel lift. Nowadays, in our part of the world, taping has been in uh, the talk of the town where our physiotherapists are uh, doing lots of these things for knee, shoulder, and bracing. They are all just conservative methods. So that was all from my talk, Dr. Tashi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rizwan. Thank you very much for that overview. So we will keep questions and answers uh, after the second talk. And you are welcome to keep posting whatever questions come into your mind on the chat box. And we will try to answer each of them one by one. So now I would like to introduce the, the next speaker. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Chamnani Rungprai. And he is the chief of the foot and ankle division in the Department of Orthopedics at from, from Mount Good Plough hospital Bangkok. Uh, he is going to give us an overview of the surgical treatment options for lateral ankle instability. So over to you, Dr. Shamnani. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. So uh, thank you the committee to let me present and join this meeting today. So uh, my topic today will be lateral ankle instability a surgical treatment options. Uh, and here is my disclosure. So I will start with this uh, video. You can see uh, when Rooney, he twists his right ankle and also this uh, American football, he twists his uh, left uh, ankle. You can see one more time, okay. And as a basketball player, you can twist his left ankle during he shoot the ball. And also the last one is a gymnastic player. Uh, when he when he landing, he twists his uh, left ankle as well. Okay. So uh, same thing, I will go a little bit of the review. So uh, ankle sprain is one of the most common injury in the sport activity. And up to 85%, there's a lateral ligament injury and about 5% is a medial side injury and 10% uh, is a syndesmotic injury. And 34 to 70% of this patient may continue to have persistent pain, swelling, and feeling of instability. So among these patients, chronic lateral ankle instability is one of the most uh, primary cause of the symptom. And this, when they have uh, lateral ankle instability, we can tell 95 of them usually have interarticular pathologies come with the lateral ankle instability. So the definition of the chronic lateral ankle instability is usually defined by recurrent sprain or repeat giving way result from trauma for at least one year. So uh, what giving way, giving way means? So the giving way means uh, uncontrolled or unpredictable excessive inversion of the ankle that's occurred during heel strike or toe off uh, when you walk or when you run. So uh, chronic lateral ankle instability is uh, already defined by mechanical instability, which means you can uh, check by physical examination and it's positive, uh, you can uh, document the instability from uh, examination. But the functional ankle instability, so the physical exam usually normal, uh, this is usually associated with the neuromuscular uh, uh, problems. So uh, for the physical examinations, uh, we are, uh, have a common two tests with the anterior dorsal test and the TLR2 test. But keep in mind when you perform this test, 
you are well performed uh, compared to the contour lateral side. Uh, one thing that you need to keep in mind is some of the patients may have a generalized hyperligament laxity. So this can be full you. So you need to be compared with the other side to see uh, how uh, different. So I, I would like to show with the uh, video to demonstrate the anterior dorsal test. You can see the sucking, uh, the dimping uh, hole on the front of the angle right here. It means the telus is moved uh, anteriorly. Compared to the right side, it's uh, normal. When you do the uh, anterior dorsal test, everything was stable and uh, no uh, dimping or sucking sound compared to the left-hand side video. And for the tail tilt test as well, so when you perform inversion straight test, you can see they open up more. Especially you can see the prominence of the tip of the fibula on the left-hand side. But on the right side, it looks normal. So we will uh, feel the, uh, the end point and the fibula tip still okay yeah, compared to the uh, patient with injury by positive tail tilt test. So for investigation, I would say MRI would be the best imaging uh, nowadays. So because it provides information for the ligament. So you can see here, the ligament here was torn and they detached uh, from the insertion of the fibula and also uh, show us the in intra-articular pathology such as a cartilage damage and also bone marrow injury, uh, we can see from an MRI. So for indication for, for surgery, so usually when the patient have ankle sprain and they develop mechanical or functional deficits, uh, including the following uh, here, such as a uh, pathological laxity, arthrokinetic uh, restriction, synovial chain like sinovitis, uh, degenerative chains of functional uh, loss, such as proprioception, neuromuscular control loss, postural control loss, impairment, or strength deficit. So when this occur and affect their daily life or daily activity, I would say this is a real indication uh, for surgery. Uh, for the technique and the surgery has been reported in the current literature. So I can grouping them uh, into this slide. So if the patient have a native ligament and the stump and the quality of the tissue still good, so you can perform open anatomic repair. It may including a, a brostrum repair, original one, and uh, by glue modification, by using uh, surrounding soft tissue to augmentation, uh, such as inferior extensor latinaculums or Clausen modification by uh, perform repair by using a drill hole or uh, perform the modified brostrum repair with the suture tip or internal based augmentations. So this is uh, open techniques. Uh, you can perform by arthroscopic technique as well. Uh, uh, they have a couple of techniques by all inside techniques or inside out technique which I'm gonna talk in a minute. Uh, if the native ligament is gone or the quality of the tissue is no good or revision case or the patient uh, have the problem with hyperligamentous laxity. So the simple uh, open repair may not yield a good outcome. So you may need to consider to do the reconstruction. So for reconstruction, I think nowadays we can grouping in uh, anatomic and non-anatomics. And non-anatomic is also the history. And I think nowadays most of the surgeon uh, ignore and, not, uh, and don't want to use this technique anymore because of the a complication and not a good outcome, which I'm going to talk in the next slide. And I would say nowadays the anatomic reconstruction become uh, popular. You can go by uh, autograph or arrow graph. You can perform by standard open techniques or you can perform by the percutaneous technique. Uh, the most commonly uh, well-known uh, popular technique is a perk or uh, antero uh, techniques. So uh, when we look into the history, so the non-anatomic reconstruction, uh, Watson, John, Alvin, or uh, Christian Snook, has been reported, okay? But this technique typ typically involves tendonitis of the uh, peroneus bevis, as you shown on the right-hand side picture. Uh, they're gonna harvest the peroneus bevis and try to do reconstruction of the ligament, try to restore the CFL and the ATFL, as shown on the right-hand side uh, picture. Uh, but the problem is of this technique. So number one, indication nowadays still controversial issue and most of the surgeon abandon this technique. And number two, the only short-term successful outcome and some of the study reported the unsatisfied long-term outcome uh, with uh, change in uh, biomechanics and cause pain and stiffness and the patient uh, not satisfied with uh, this uh, non-anatomic reconstruction. And also when compared with the normal repair, they have a high rate of wound complications compared to the simple repair as we usually do. 
So uh, the things that can be explained why non-anatomic not uh, popular nowadays because they alter or the impairment of the ankle and also the subtalar joint function uh, based on the biomechanical study. And also uh, for the outcome study, they perform a prospective comparing uh, treatment snook and modify brostrom repair in 40 patients in chronic ankle instability. And they report several patients uh, treated with non-anatomic uh, procedure report a too tight uh, on the ankle and difficult to walk, especially on uneven ground. And they're not happy with this type of the surgery. This means uh, nowadays this technique is less and less uh, in daily practice. So for anatomic repair, I, uh, I can show you with the uh, brostrum repair, which I'm gonna show in the next couple of slides. Uh, this is the original one that has been performed. And also clue uh, add on the inferior extensor layer tenaculum, which is a uh, uh, augmentation, increased stability and strength of the repair around 15 to 20% compared to just the brostrum repair alone. And uh, this is a different technique by using a repair through the drill hole bone tunnel. Because in some patient, you may have avulsion injury uh, to the bone. Uh, it's difficult to repair with the uh, ligament to the ligament. It's just, uh, maybe impossible. So you may need to use a drill hole and uh, put the uh, ligament attached to the bone. Okay, or you can perform by using a suture anchor, which is uh, much more easier, but the problem is about the price is uh, quite high. Okay, and the uh, last one uh, gonna be a uh, modified uh, brostrum repair with the suture tip uh, augmentation, which I'm gonna talk about the concept and why this technique is become uh, more popular uh, nowadays. Okay, for the anatomic uh, reconstruction, uh, I would say this technique should uh, be uh, the first round of treatment Okay, no matter what you do, the augmentation or not. Okay, this should be the first right treatment when you consider to do the surgery for the patients. Advantage of anatomic repair, including a uh, low cost. Okay, uh, you probably uh, pay only for the suture, which is uh, maybe uh, I would say 50 uh, US dollars and simple procedure and less invasive compared to the uh, autograph uh, augmentation or autograph augmentation and also low complications compared to the big incision uh, compared to the non-anatomic repair. Uh, however, this technique still have limitation because uh, they have, you cannot perform in the patient who have insufficient ligamentous tissue and if they fail, uh, revision cases may be difficult. Uh, if they have a big body, high body mass index, uh, if they have a generalized ligamentous laxity because uh, some of the study re already report if you perform a simple uh, anatomic repair, you have a 50% chance to fail uh, following a simple repair. So you need to keep in mind to check uh, hyperligamentous hyper laxity for all of your patients. So I will uh, show uh, and share some of my technique. Uh, I will show for the uh, following uh, uh, technique here and then show to you guys and you can have any question at the end of the presentations. So I will start with the, the most commonly used uh, nowadays. This is my old practice back to uh, six, seven years ago. So I perform uh, only a modified uh, brostrom glue uh, technique. So I use a supine position uh, with the thigh tunica and I use a bump uh, on the affected hips to make sure that the ankle is in the neutral position or slightly inversion because it's easier to perform the, the surgery in these positions. And I prefer a long tunnel incision from about five centimeter above of the tip of the fibula and then uh, uh, incline and then toward uh, the uh, uh, talus uh, neck junction. Which, uh, this is the attachment of the ATFL ligament. So I perform, uh, I prefer this uh, long tunnel incision if the patient has uh, concomitance or simultaneously a perineal bear with pathology, you can uh, take care of this with the same incision. And you can also perform the suture tip augmentation with this technique is much more uh, easier. And also this incision may be friendly to the nerve because the intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerve is right here and the sternum nerve is right there. It may be easier for you and not injury to this nerve. And uh, for the uh, soft tissue, you may need to be carefully dissect the soft tissue because they're gonna have the connecting branch between the intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerve and the sural nerve as shown on my uh, cadaveric study, you will see that the connecting band is present around five to 10% in normal populations, okay? Uh, if you just go uh, deeply, you can cut this nerve easily and cause neuroma uh, at the end. And this, to keep in mind as well, this nerve can cause a problem in all kinds of percutaneous techniques and also 
uh, arthroscopic techniques because you cannot identify this nerve. You can tie the suture wrap around this nerve and cause nerve pain, neuritis, or neuroma as well. So the next step after I uh, identify the tip of the fibula, so I will identify the sheet of the pineal tendon. I will make a poke hole uh, about 1.5 uh, 1 uh, centimeter and then I retack the peroneal tendon down inferiorly and posteriorly. So it's not be uh, involved in my field and we will save during uh, my procedure. And then I just reduce a hemostat to go from the bottom to the anterior part next to the tip of the fibula. And I use a knife to cut just uh, over the uh, hemostat. Uh, this can be helped to protect the underlying soft tissue and also the peroneal tendons uh, uh, posterior here. So the next step, uh, after you are uh, exposed to the tip of the fibula, you can clean uh, some uh, remnant of the stump. You can make, uh, use a marking pen to make a center of the stump in the ATFL and also stand the stump on the CFL as well. And oftentimes you can see the uh, bony fragment, like uh, avulsion fracture, you can remove it at the same time. Uh, in some patients, if they have a big, more than, I would say eight to 10 millimeter, as it's a kill injury, I will say I will fix it. Because if you take it off, you will have a big hole. And oftentimes you cannot bring the ATFL back in press because they have a big gap here. So if a big one, uh, I prefer uh, to a uh, fixation and then you can perform uh, the modified Brostom cool uh, as the normally techniques. So, uh, and then I prefer the best by using a rancher, you can use a hemostat, or you can use a knife to cut the remnant of the fibrosis and scar uh, from the bone until you get the bleeding bone like that. So this is will help to the new ligament to attach uh, to the new bone. And then, uh, so my uh, position of my anchor. So I usually put, uh, let's see the, the clock here. So I usually put my CFL at the couple millimeter uh, anterior to the tip of the uh, posterior part of the uh, fibula at the six o'clock. And then I usually put my ATFL about a centimeter, but at around 8.30 or nine o'clock right here. Okay, I have the reason because uh, nowadays I cheap to do the uh, suture tape augmentation. I need to have some space here to put the another suture tape. So if you it is these two tunnel to close together, you cannot have space to put the suture tape augmentation. But if you just do a modified Boston glue modification, you don't need to put it uh, too far. You can go at the center of the stump in each uh, ATFL and CFL. And here what the suture look like. So nowadays I am not do the suture uh, uh, through the bone tunnel. I always do uh, using a, a suture anchor, which is much more uh, easier and safe time for me to do this procedure. So, and then the next step, I will repair the CFL ligament by uh, throw the suture and make sure that the assistant will retract the pillineal brevis and longest down enough. And you have some space that you can uh, suture the uh, native CFL ligament you should go as bottom as you can and make sure you grab the good quality of the tissue. And I always use the force fan in each uh, ligament to make sure that it gets a strongest uh, construct. Okay, and then the next step, I repair the ATFL lemon to here. So this is my first round for the uh, broad storm, original broad storm repair. And then I will tie uh, this off suture. So I will uh, tie at the anchor maximum uh, eversion for the uh, CFL in a, a neutral position. And then for the ATFL, I will go in the slightly plant of action around 20 or 30 degrees and slightly, uh, slightly posterior drawer test. And then I will tie in this position. So uh, the next step I will repair, uh, we call uh, extensor retina uh, column reconstruction. This is a glue uh, modification. So I will augment uh, by using a needle to, to repair the preosium at the tip of the fibula first and then go down uh, to the extensor retinaculum, uh, I go uh, about halfway. Okay, but carefully, sometimes the subtube very thin, it can cut through. Okay, so, uh, and then also have some uh, recent study reported that no matter what you uh, repair the uh, augmentation with the inferior extensor retinaculums, this issue will be uh, attenuated and it won't help for long term. But I still, I still believe in the original uh, glue modification. This is my technique, that's why I still uh, do the uh, inferior extensor retinaculum augmentation in all of my cases. And here at the end, after I finish to repair, uh, do, do the reconstruction. So uh, this is about six years ago, but a couple of years ago, I changed my mind 
uh, the reason I changed my mind because of the they have some lim limitation following the original uh, Brostrom procedure or Brostrom tool uh, techniques. So they have studied from raw drop. So they, they mentioned that uh, when you do the ATFL and the CFL repair, even by a suture anchor or do the bone uh, through the bone tunnel, uh, they, the, the strength from the ligament that do repair, they will drop compared to the intact uh, ATFL ligament. And they showed the study that uh, the strength will be dropped at least 50% at the time zero. Right after you repair, the strength after you repair is just about 50% compared to the native or intact ATFL ligament. So this is uh, insufficient or is it not good idea that you will allow your patient to move right away because the strength was not even 50%. So you can have a premature failure uh, of the repair. So that so that why they recommend to do the early protection uh, of our brostrom repair and carefully if you want to do the early uh, rehabilitation. This is quite contradict or quite disagreement with uh, nowadays uh, in terms of sport uh, rehabilitation protocol. Uh, all of our region in human body we increase a lot of patient to do early mobilization, uh, early rehabilitation. Yeah, that's why this technique won't allow us to do that. You need to keep the patient in the uh, non-weight bearing, even in the splint or can locking booth for four to six weeks. After that, you can allow the patient to do the range of motion and it's quite uh, slow, okay? And if you disagree with this and, okay, I want to try my patient to walk early. So what's going on if you will have the elongations uh, of the ligament compared to uh, the group that you protect the ligament? So this is another good study uh, from uh, Campbell that they mentioned that your ligament will be elongation if you let the patient uh, return uh, to activity too quick or uh, you perform range of motion exercise too quick. So uh, this has come with the question, if can Brostrom repair patient can perform early rehabilitation? I said, yes, you can, but you may run into the ligament elongation and ultimate load is about 50% of the native ligament. This can cause to failure after the surgery. So this is, uh, that's why the, the technique. So uh, need to be careful because this is uh, have uh, things that invent or uh, create from uh, our tech company. They may have conflict of interest uh, to advertising this technique. But for me, when I look into this technique and I read and I try this, uh, uh, right now I'm inclined to use this technique because, because of the internal breast that can hold uh, the talus and fibula in press and quite strong. And this can allow you immediate early range of motion and also even weight bearing. Okay, and they have this is study that has support by the companies. Okay, you need to keep in mind for this. But you can see the yellow one is the patient who have a brostrom repair with suture tape augmentation. You compare to the native ligament, it's 150%. This is a 250%, almost two times uh, stronger than the native ligament. And this is the brostrom original repair, just about 50%. So you can see there's much more stronger. If you like the concept of the early rehabilitation or uh, early bearing patient can return to sport, return to work, or we call fast and recovery time, you may need to uh, consider this technique. So I, I would like to show you the uh, technique for the suture tape uh, augmentation. Uh, I'm not sure anyone uh, in Pakistan do this technique, but this thing is what quite common uh, also in my country is uh, increasing, uh, gain, increasing popularity in the past couple of years and uh, a lot of us do this techniques. Okay, uh, same thing that we perform uh, longitudinal incisions, uh, as I mentioned to you, and you do the test to check the stability and so also the anterior double and tail tilt test. And then uh, same thing that we use the same technique. I might skip this uh, quickly. I just mentioned to you that I use a uh, 3.0 millimeters uh, bio suture tag uh, for the suture anchor. One, I repair the ATFL for the native ligament and one, I repair the CFL, okay. And then for the concept, uh, for the insert, the suture tape augmentation. So we insert at the telonic uh, area, so which is you can use the fluoroscopy to see uh, at the center of the telonic, or you can uh, peel off the ligament and uh, use your eye to see inside in non-articular surface. Uh, just, this is just, uh, we can use a split bridge. Split. You can use a survival lock. I usually use a 475 uh, millimeter at the telonic, okay? And then I use the, uh, 3.5 at the fibula. Okay, this is a suture tape look like. Okay, and then uh, before you tie, you need to put the hemostat to make sure it's not too tight. If you don't have hemostat, it can be too tight. 
and I, I usually do perform in a slightly uh, plantar flexion. Okay, not neutral, it's about uh, 15, 20 degree uh, plantar flexion. And then you can tie in suture. This is uh, uh, how we do the uh, suture tape augmentation. It's very rock and solid. And this will change my uh, uh, post-operative protocol uh, following uh, this uh, technique. So here was uh, my original post-operative protocol. I performed this. Uh, this is my slide I have done uh, about a couple of years ago. Uh, usually I could put splint for two weeks and also protecting them in uh, early range of motions. Uh, I, I am the person who, uh, pair, pair surgeon who like to perform early range of motion. I still protective with marrying for six weeks and then allow them to go range of motion uh, fully at six weeks and jogging at 12 weeks and then uh, running uh, and return to sport after four months. Okay. But when I shift my gear to the uh, suture tap augmentation, you can see uh, I can allow them to walk at two weeks and then can walk, they can walk full weight bearing and do range of motion exercise between four to six weeks. And they can do range of motion exercise and jogging after six weeks. They can return to sport uh, at three months which is uh, about a month or two quicker than the standard technique that have been done. Okay, the last technique is arthroscopic uh, technique, which is I cannot deny this technique. Even I like uh, open more, but uh, we cannot deny the advancing of technologies and a lot of patients looking for the arthroscopic treatment. So they have uh, all inside out techniques and also the outside in technique, which is I can uh, show a couple of videos and uh, the techniques that have been done. Okay, this is a picture to, to show you. This is a normal and good uh, ATFL ligament uh, by atroscopy. This is the tip of the fibula. This is the ATFL. You can see the tension is very, very good conditions. And this is the talus right here. On the right-hand side, you still can see the ligament, but the tip of the fibula here, the talus here, and this is the ATFL, but it looks loose compared to the left-hand side, okay? So some patients, they may have the ligament still there, but they are on, uh, in uh, laxity mode, okay, or flexible mode, or loosening of the ligaments. So, and, and, and some patient may present with you with the torn ligament, you can see here, this is the ATFL, this is the torn right here. Some of them may still attach to the foot, uh, original foot pin, but some of them may be detached and some may have some scar right there. And this is another patient that's have, this is the ATFL, they fall down uh, the, uh, close to the telus and not attached. Uh, to the ATFL. It is an example of the arthroscopic picture. You can use arthroscopy to identify the injury, okay, but it's also used to do the, perform the surgery at the same time. But if you don't like to perform the open uh, arthroscopic surgery, you can convert to do the open later on. But a uh, powerful of arthroscopy can identify the entire articular pathology. You can take off our synovitis and you also can do treatment of the tendon, also the bony fragment as well. So uh, for my instrument, uh, same thing, position, I use the supine with the BAM, and this here is my instrument. So you can use the, uh, we call it Michael Russell. You can uh, reuse this, uh, I think it would say around seven to 10 times, you can reuse this. The price is, uh, is around uh, 300 uh, US dollars. And the rest of them, I think you guys may have it. Uh, it's a basic set for the arthroscopy. Uh, so uh, for the portal, okay, this is standard portal for arthroscopy. So uh, I usually use the anterior medial portal as shown here. Uh, this portal just right uh, medial to the tibis anterior tendon. Uh, the red one represent the uh, tibis anterior tendons. And then at the same of the level of the joy line, okay, you can use your finger to palpate. If you are a beginner and you're not sure, you can check by using a full roll, but I don't think you need it. Or you can use a needle to poke into it and find the joy line as well. So they have many techniques to uh, find the correct joy line, okay. And then uh, for the anterolateral uh, portal, uh, we usually uh, perform uh, lateral to the peroneal tertius, it's on the or red uh, arrows. And then uh, need to be uh, lateral to the uh, intermediate dorsal kindernia plan. I would, I would say you're supposed to be far away, at least five millimeter, and try not injury. Otherwise, you can cause a neuropathy or even injury to the nerve and cause neuroma. So it can ruin your uh, uh, surgery after uh, you finish everything. The patient can end up with the painful after this. So uh, for the lateral in, uh, incision, I usually go longer because I need to put the, a passport uh, as shown on the right-hand side bottom here is quite big. Uh, you cannot do six millimeter as standard uh, anterior medial portal. You need to do uh, a little bit bigger. So it be able to insert this passport. So this one is very, very important. If you don't have this one, you can injure it to the s pin easily. It has been done in the past around 10 cases without the passport. So I would say 50% of my patients have neuritis. Uh, of the SPN, which is, uh, can make me headache. 
So that's why I use a passport nowadays for my technique. So the first thing I will uh, show you the uh, all inside techniques. Uh, this is the same picture. This is the footprint, uh, the base of the ATFL, and this is a ligament that's detached uh, from the insertion. Uh, here's a, a video to show you. So you can use a chair to clean some uh, scar and soft tissue. And then I create the footprint. Okay, I eat the bone. It's about, uh, about three, five uh, millimeter to make sure that you have no scar uh, to the bone. Okay, this is the way where we do the uh, footprint uh, preparations. And then uh, after that, I will insert the suture anchor. You can use a three, five uh, suture anchor through the deal hole. Uh, you can do everything uh, through, the, uh, through the arthroscopy. Okay, this is the way we uh, show you the position. That's just the way we put the uh, anchor suture. And here's how the anchor suture look like after we pull out uh, the, uh, uh, the, the sleeve. Okay, and then how uh, you uh, repair the uh, remnant of the ATF valve back uh, to your footprint, you use a micro rosso uh, to go uh, underneath of the native ligament. And you can use, uh, we call micro rosso, they have a wire, small wire. And you can use a grasper to grab this uh, wire and you can pass the suture uh, to this wire, okay? So after you pass the suture, uh, you pass the suture wrap around uh, the native ligament and you, you hold tightly, so you can see them. They can squid, okay, the native ligament uh, close to the footprint and then you can tie later on. I usually, I usually go two rounds to make sure it's not cut through my uh, native ligament, okay, before I tie uh, to the footprint. Yeah, I usually go two rounds. This is my second round. And then I can try uh, by using, uh, uh, you can try uh, by using uh, the instrument to help. And here is after I finish, you can see that uh, compared to the first picture and it's quite tight and you can restore all the ATF out back in press. Okay, this is a stability that I show you. Uh, this is compared to before. Okay, this is what we call all inside. You don't need to worry about the nerve anymore because everything can be finished by just repair the ATF out alone. Okay, so, uh, Another technique uh, we call inside out technique. This is invent from Josh Asivio and uh, Peter Mangold. Uh, this is from Artex style, okay? So this one, you need to use uh, two suture anchors. So I will show you the video uh, right here. Okay, you just create, this is a case as a six week for my ankle sprain. And uh, his, uh, this case, I was consulted for my colleague to do the surgery. You can see here was the uh, original ATF out after the injury. And then same thing, uh, you clean the base, uh, similar to the technique I shown you before. I may go a little bit quicker because we maybe run out of time. Just make sure you clean about five millimeter. And then this is uh, how I'm, after I clean and then the native ligament. And then I, I do the same thing by putting the third anchor uh, at the location I show you and then tie the third knot. And then uh, I insert the second suture, sorry. This is my second suture up here. It's about uh, eight millimeter. And then we tie for the second round, okay. And then uh, we can insert this, the, the, all the suture. For this technique, you need to do the inferior extensor retinacum reconstruction by uh, the second round suture. Okay, uh, let me show you here. Yeah, well, here was the technique that we go uh, for the inferior extensor retinacum uh, reconstruction by uh, using the same thing, micro rosso, uh, from, go from here, go to the joint, okay? And here is how it looked from the first uh, two round. And the next slide, this is how it look uh, at the end. So you can you will have four uh, suture like that. Okay, two for the ATFL and two for close to the CFL, but not exactly ATFL, but close to the ATFL. And then you can make a small hole there. Okay, and then you can use the uh, we call the uh, probe uh, to uh, hook up the suture. Okay, in all of the suture, and then and then you can tie uh, all of them at the end with the central small incision like that. Okay. Okay, and after the surgery, it's quite stable. I, I would say it's really impressive uh, to perform these uh, techniques. Okay, and the patient is good. If they have good quality of the ligament and they're young, and especially for women, I prefer this technique. Okay, and here's my post-operative uh, protocol. I use sprint for two weeks, and here was the suture, how it looked. This is my, uh, I used a, a tie rope, or uh, the suture tape uh, for the, a concomitant synaptic injury. Okay, and this is uh, about uh, two months after the arthroscopic, arthroscopic surgery. And this is about four months. This is a gentleman is about four months and he can run very fast. Okay, and he ready to return to uh, sport. And he can, he can jump, he can run. 
Yeah, he can jump, he can run, he can do pretty much everything uh, after four months uh, from the surgery. Okay, so uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Shamnani. Uh, very nice and detailed uh, talk on uh, uh, several of uh, the important uh, techniques for uh, lateral collateral ligament repair. Uh, so now we will open the floor to questions. If any of the uh, audience uh, has any questions, including the, the faculty, uh, the faculty can use their mic while the uh, Participants are welcome to write on the chat box. Dr. Ashwin, I have a question for Dr. Chamnani. So, yes, yes. whenever uh, we are doing a, a tendon reconstruction, for example, a coupling reconstruction of uh, anterior and uh, calcaneofibular ligament, what do you, do you recommend that whether we should keep autograph beneath the peroneal tendons or above the peroneal tendons? So uh, this is, uh, I think this is, a, this is a challenging question. So uh, I, I need to tell you uh, first, so based on my experience, I have done zero to the autograph or autograph reconstructions, but I have been trained by my mentor in uh, UC of Iowa. Uh, they, they also, they use uh, autograph and they always use this uh, next to the calcaneus, uh, uh, close to the calcaneus and the period tendon above it. So in my hand, okay, I, I have a problem with autograph in my country. We don't have autograph in my country. And for autograph, when I talk pro and con to my patients, some of them uh, don't like to do this technique. So in my hand, when I do revision case, so I, use, I usually use a suture tape as I showed you before. And one leg of my suture tape will go represent the CFL ligament. And I put it as close at the calcaneus as much as possible, okay? Because I want it to be holding the calcaneus in place. If I push uh, superficial to the peroneal tendon, I am not sure it will, the stability will hold strongly enough. And when I tie this ligament, it will rub on my peroneal tendon. It can cause irritation. It can cause ulceration or even rupture. Yeah, that's why if I answer you, I, I would say I incline to put it close to my calcaneus. But like I said, I have no experience uh, after I finish my fellowship. Right, thank you very much. So any any other questions for? So if I, if I can ask uh, Dr. Shamlani a, a, a question. Yes. Uh, regarding yes. regarding these uh, patients with laxity, you, you uh, correctly said that a lot of them get recurrent uh, uh, instability uh, but in any case uh, when they are symptomatic then surgery has to be done so do you take any special precautions or any special technique for these patients with uh, with uh, ligamentous instability okay thank you for your question so uh, I had been done I would say five percent of my lateral ligament reconstruction patient they have uh, a brighton criteria more than by point uh, uh, six to ten, so uh, I has been done just a simple techniques as I mentioned earlier, and a few of them, uh, two three cases uh, came back with the instability, so I need to do revision surgery, but uh, nowadays, okay, I I change my mind because when you reconstruction to the ligament, their hormones oxytocin or prolactin that can make the ligament become uh, loosening again. So that's why when you do the suture tape augmentations, your, your body cannot do anything about it. Okay, if you put in the right position, that will hold on uh, in press. And uh, based on my experience, I did around 120 cases uh, with the uh, modified Bostrom repair open techniques. I have about 20 cases with the hyperligament laxity. Two or three of my patients fail to come back. I do revision surgery in two cases. It quite much, uh, I would say it's about 10% in my hand. Yeah, but after I perform the internal based augmentation for the last six, seven, eight cases with the hyperligament laxity, uh, all of them happy. I have one patient do one with uh, modified Brostorm glue modification 
and the right hand side glue modification with suture tape augmentation. Uh, she definitely tell me she like the suture tape augmentation more than the other side. They're much more stable. Okay, this just a chair. Uh, the idea. I, I'm working on the research, but I need more patients. There's still small number of the patient, and I need to keep uh, following my patients. Have you ever uh, had it, uh, wound problems when we're using these uh, fiber tape or suture yeah. wire, or fiber wire? Uh, we have started to use them uh, more and more in the last uh, few years, uh, not just in foot and ankle, but also in other other uh, joints. But uh, we have had a few cases where there were wound uh, problems. Yeah, so what I, is your experience? I think I did more than, right now, I think I did more than 50, uh, 50 cases with the internal breast augmentations. I have only one patient with a minor wound complication because she has a poor control diabetes. Uh, we don't know that before the surgery, but after the surgery, we check and then she have a poor, uh, she have a diabetes. Who, who, Hemoglobin A1 is more than 10. It's only one case and take my oral antibiotics the wound heal after four weeks. It's only one case that I have. I think the, the key thing is to protect the soft tissue and speed up the process. If you can uh, do the, 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 this procedure, uh, I don't know my, 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 and my average duration for the uh, brostom glue modification alone is around 30 to 40 minutes. But if I add on uh, suture tape augmentation, it will be around 50 uh, to 70 minutes. I would say if you can take it down within one hour, uh, a little bit beyond one hour, I, I think the time will help you uh, for the infections. Yeah. Okay, good. good. Thank you. So anything else from the audience? We have some of our faculty who, who have joined. Uh, Dr. Shams Tabriz has joined. Uh, Dr. Masood Umar was here. Dr. Yasser Mohib is here. Uh, those are, uh, they are all part of our orthopedic uh, uh, community here. Uh, if I can see. If any of you, Dr. Har Harun has, of course, uh, he has been here right from the start. Dr. Harun, uh, do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tashwin. It was a wonderful uh, elaboration of the technique as well as it did add knowledge to me. Um, uh, if there is anything left, I would I would ask you. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Rizwan. Rizwan, you mentioned uh, about the in the conservative manage, management, the, uh, the, physio, the role of physiotherapy and proprioceptive exercises. Uh, there, there is a lot of, uh, I think there is some confusion among the uh, physiotherapists sometimes about what uh, kind of proprioceptive exercises are appropriate. Uh, could you uh, kindly elaborate on what is the best protocol? So, uh, so, so the best way which I which uh, I learned in my fellowship training was in China was to ask a patient to stand on one leg and keep his or her eye closed for about two to three minutes. And that should be repeated at about eight to time, eight to 10 times per day, but that is the second level. So the, the simple best exercise, uh, which my professor usually uh, recommended was to just keep your eye closed, stand on one leg for about one, two minutes, keep your eyes closed and the procedure should be repeated at around eight to ten times per day mm -hmm. on both the legs. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you for that. And um, uh, Dr. Shamnani, are we uh, uh, when treating a patient uh, conservatively? Uh, what is your? If, do you ever use uh, um, dynamic braces? Yeah, so uh, I may share my, my nowadays uh, treatment for the non-operative uh, for the patient with lateral ankle instability. So I would say if they have a significant swelling, uh, severe ectensive ectosis, I will use a posterior splint 
uh, for two weeks, one or two weeks. Just that it. It's a two weeks as a maximum. And then I will go with the, the later less up breast. It doesn't need to be rigid. Okay, I will go uh, later less up breast with a the tie. They can, they can use that one and they can do a partial weight bearing uh, or weight bearing as a target that and they, they put a version, but allow them to do a dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And I allow them to go only dorsiflexion and plantar flexion until six weeks. And after six weeks, I do eversion and inversion exercise. Yeah, for, for the rigid breast, if they have enough money, insurance cover, yeah, I would go the, uh, we call ash board with the stirrup in both uh, sides. But if they don't, don't have insurance coverage, I would go with the, the, the lower price I am sharing a, an image from Google about the different types of braces. So what you are talking about is, I, I think you mean a lace-up brace like this one. Uh, like the tie, like they have suture uh, with the suture. This is uh, this is like asphalt. This is asphalt. The bottom one is asphalt. Uh, you you should be less up L A C A C L L A C E U P. Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the bottom one, the less up. Can you go a little bit down? Yeah, uh, no, let me just uh, show it. Yeah, less up and go and go, go support. Yeah, yeah, like that. Yes. Yeah, you can click. So uh, yeah, they have they have some study. Uh, this one more convenient for the patient. Okay, if if you if you uh, discuss about which one was the most solid and rigid, yeah, with the the hard stir up that's the that's the most strongest one but uh during the day when they walk with that one or even wearing shoe is slightly difficult and they have uncomfortable yeah if you go with the, this this is uh less up they're more comfortable but they still can have effective in terms of resistant eversion or inversion uh, motion uh, for the patients okay but the price this one in my country is about i would say uh, I would say a hundred, at fifty to seventy US dollar, but for the one that with the syrup is about two times expensive than the first one. Mm -hmm. We we also have these ones available in the local market. The uh, air brace, as it is called, with inflatable uh, gel foam on the inside, uh, yeah. and hard hard plastic liner. Yeah, this this one is good too because they have the soft one uh, close to the skin. Yeah, this one you can use this one too. Yeah, I think all of them is good, but it depends on on how patient like. Okay. Right. Yeah, that that's great. So. Uh... Right. So, uh, Doctor Zwan, uh, do you? Do you, oh, do you have any other questions or comments? I thank you. So, so we are uh, right on time. Uh, I appreciate and I would like to thank Dr. Shamnani Rungprai for sparing his time to talk to us on this evening. Right now, it's, uh, it's almost 8 o'clock in the night. It's probably <laughs> dinner time in, in, in Thailand. Uh, so we are thankful to him for, for giving us this time. And uh, we know that in, in, in foot and ankle is a, a very dynamic specialty with a lot of uh, changes uh, keep happening. So we need to keep ourselves updated. That is why we wanted to keep uh, we keep involving people from uh, Pakistan and people from outside Pakistan uh, who have uh, experience and and uh, expertise of uh, foot, uh, specialty, specialty foot and ankle surgery uh, for the benefit of the other people uh, who uh, join us for these webinars. Once again, thank you very much to all the participants and to both speakers, Dr. Rizwan Haroon and Dr. Jamnani. And we like to uh, we we hope to see you again in the future in future events. We would like to keep you involved. And hopefully, once they be able to physically meet you, maybe somewhere else, or maybe we will invite you to come to Pakistan. So, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doctor Shah. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank Dr. you Zwan, very much. Thank uh, you. And have and have a good evening. Doctor Harun wants to say something. Uh, yeah. Oh, so uh, this is just, uh, if you allow me, I just want to make an announcement. Um, yes, please. Uh, for the next webinar, uh, just uh, one correction required on this poster you see on your screen. The time is changed from the 4 p.m. to 
5:30 p.m. Pakistan Standard Time instead of morning mentioned on this poster. So thank you very much, everybody. Please register for this webinar in time so that you can benefit from the local as well as international faculty experience. Thank you. Very much.